Hey guys, so today we are we're winding 2,000 years and we are going to be talking about Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So the first thing to understand about Aristotle's ethical framework is that it is naturalistic. And what does that mean? Um, it means that his ethical system is derived from nature. Um, he's trying to create an ethical framework that somehow naturally comes from the natural order of things. So if we think of uh, nature as being what is, right, everything that exists, Aristotle is going to claim that we can derive an ought or a should out of facts regarding what is, right? Because you always want to remember that ethics is about what should be the case, whereas reality is what is the case, right? So his naturalistic ethics is going to try and derive a should from what is. And the benefit of doing this if it works, is that it gives us some kind of objectivity to rely on, right? It erases any kind of wishy-washiness because we're saying, hey, we're doing things naturally, right? In terms of the natural order. So to kind of back up a bit, um, we have to know what Aristotle thinks about nature in general, and then we could apply these general principles to human nature, and then once we do that, then we could push forward in his ethics, right? So one thing to note about Aristotle's view of reality um, is that it is teleological. So teleology, right, comes from this root word uh, in Greek called telos. And telos just means something like end or goal. And to look at something teleologically is to look at it in terms of what it is directed towards. So Aristotle believes that nature is inherently teleological, right? That all things that exist are directed towards some specific end, right? They're goal-oriented in a manner of speaking. So for example, um, the seedling seeks to become a tree, right? Or the embryo seeks to become a fully formed human or something like that, right? Um, obviously, it's metaphorical. The tree doesn't seek. It doesn't think, right? But the idea is that something has an end state and it is inherently directed at that end state. And all things in nature work like this. And so if all things in nature work like this, that means humans work like this, right? Because humans are part of nature, and so humans have a nature to them. And interestingly enough, um, the examples I gave you, notice they were all like autonomic functions, right? Things that don't require thought or consciousness, just like seed becoming tree, embryo becoming person. Um, it's not always the case, right? This applies to those uh, automatic functions in nature, but it also works with in more intentional things, right? So human action for Aristotle is also teleological. And what he means by this is he wants to say that all acts point towards some end. In other words, Whenever someone does something, it is always for the sake of something beyond itself, right? There's the thing, and then there's the thing it's directed at. And another way we could um, understand acts is to understand them in terms of means, right? So actions are always means of obtaining some goal, or like a way you get there, right? So being in line with the teleological structure, we know that all acts are directed at some end. And he says it could be anything, right? He says house making is directed towards the telos or the end of a house. Um, generalship in war is directed towards victory, right? If you make guitars, 
then the ultimate product, right, the end, is the guitar. So all things are for the sake of some goal beyond itself. Uh, but what Aristotle wants to say is that not all ends are equal, right? Some ends wind up being means to even further ends. So let's kind of draw a diagram here uh, to make sure everything is making sense. So let's say we have action X, and we say that, oh, action X is done for the sake of Y. But wait a second, maybe Y is just an intermediate step. Maybe Y is not the ultimate goal. Actually, Y is a means to Z. So what we would say is that you know X is a means to Y, which is an end, but this end is also a means to this even greater end, right? So some things in the process are kind of both, right? You do something in order to something else, but you do that something else in order to something else. And what Aristotle wants to say is that these ends that are also means towards greater ends are kind of subordinate to those greater ends. Um, they're less valuable than those greater ends. Why? Well, because it's only for the sake of those ends that all the stuff here is undertaken. Um, and an example of where you'd have an intermediate end is maybe something like, um, let's say I want to have a certain career, right? Now, in order to get that certain career, I have to go to school to get the degree, right? But then maybe the next step is I have to get an internship or something. So I do this so that I can get that, so that I can get that end goal, right? There's always this process. Um, and the process could actually be quite long, right? You could, in theory, do A in order to B, in order to C, um, you know, in order to X, in order to Y, in order to Z. So imagine like the whole alphabet's there. The point is these chains could wind up being very long, but the general principles that Aristotle is talking about still hold, in that B is more valuable than A, since it's only for the sake of B that A was done, but then C is more valuable than both A and B, because it's for the sake of C that both of those were done, and then if you follow this all the way to the end, Z would wind up being the most valuable, because it's for the sake of Z, that ultimate end, that everything else is done. Now one question you might have is, wait, but aren't certain things done for the sake of themselves? Like, what if I just want to work out, right? Because it, it puts me in a better headspace, and I'm not doing it for any other reason than that. Well, even if you look at something like that, notice how there was still an end. It's like, maybe you're not working out to get jacked, but you're working out to clear your head, to become more disciplined. And that's a goal that's beyond the activity itself. You're still doing the activity to get some desired outcome. So first step to know is that Aristotle's ethics are going to relate to this teleological uh, view of things. So one might be wondering, well, okay, if basically everything is a means towards an end, and even though those ends wind up being means towards greater ends, is there really an end to that chain? Like, is there a, a goal or a telos that is so absolute that it is, it is for the sake of nothing else? That everything else is for the sake of it, and then that's it? Once we hit that, that's the end? And the answer for Aristotle is yes. He thinks that all human activities ultimately are directed towards this thing called eudaimonia, right? And that's a Greek term. Now, this sometimes gets translated as happiness, but that's not the greatest translation, and we'll learn a little bit more about that. So, if I were to ask you, you know, why are you taking this class? You might say, 
oh, I'm taking this class so that I can get credit. Well, why do you want to get credit? So that I can get my degree and graduate. Why do you want that? Well, so that I could have this job. Why do you want to do that? Well, so that I can create a life for myself. Okay, well, why do you want that? And you might end up by saying like, oh, because I want to be happy, right? I want to have a good life. So notice how all your actions point towards that one thing. And that one thing is something like the good life. But the good life isn't quite the same as happiness. So there are a few ways of translating eudaimonia that are more effective. Um, one way to understand eudaimonia, and probably my favorite way, is to understand it as something like flourishing, right? Human flourishing. You do all things so that you are the best human you could be, right? You're not just adequate. You are flourishing. Uh, another way of understanding it is etymologically, you know, because this means something like good, and then daimon means something like spirit. So eudaimonia means something like good spiritedness, having a good spirit, um, being in a way that makes you closer to the gods. And that makes sense, right? Because being closer to the gods would obviously mean that you're flourishing. Um, or even as simple as living well. The good life, right? The capital G, the good life. So the reason that's not the same as happiness is because you could be happy because you, I don't know, you had off class. And is that what Aristotle means about the thing we're aiming towards? No. Or you could be like, oh, I got to stay home today and I ate a bunch of junk food and watched Netflix. I'm happy. Is that the kind of thing he's talking about? No, right? Eudaimonia is like the grandest form of happiness. That's why it's being more godlike, right? Flourishing. And this is the thing that we're all aiming for. Now, the question is, how do we get there? And to understand how we achieve our ultimate end, right, our telos, eudaimonia, we have to understand a little bit more about how anything reaches its end. So again, we're taking this view of nature in general and then eventually applying it to human nature. So uh, to understand this, we have to look at the concept of function, right? What does it mean to function? One way of explaining function is to say, oh, to function means to, to adequately perform your task, right? Or to do the thing that it was intended to do. Uh, or to have a purpose or something like that, right? Now, if we look at an inanimate object, something simple like an eraser, and I said, oh, what's the function of an eraser? You would say, well, the function of an eraser is to remove the markings on the whiteboard. And you would say that an eraser functions when it does that, and that it doesn't function when it doesn't do that. Similarly, what's the function of a marker? Well, to write things. What's the function of a hammer, right? To drive in nails. And we say that in all those cases, <clears throat> It's not that all of those things function and function equally, right? We say sometimes the object functions, sometimes it doesn't, right? Maybe the eraser is a little screwed up and it doesn't actually work. It doesn't remove the markings, so it's not functional. Or the marker runs out of ink so that it's no longer functional. Or the hammer is chipped so it doesn't perform its task. And what this tells us is that in order for something to function, it needs to have certain qualities, right? Things need certain qualities in order to function well. That's the main idea. So to take uh, the hammer, again, for example, it's like, well, what does a hammer need to function well? Well, it needs a hard, heavy head, right? Or else it's not going to drive in the nails. It needs a handle right? Because it's not going to work as well if you're just kind of like pummeling a hard thing into a nail. And it also needs a, a solid connection between those two, because if you just have a hard head loosely balancing on a wooden stick, when you do that, it's going to fly back and hit someone, not going to do the job it's supposed to do, right? So the principle here is that things need certain qualities in order to function well. Now, to function well means to achieve something's end. So the longer way of saying this would be things need certain qualities 
in order to attain their end or their telos or their goals, right? But the thing is, this is a, a claim about nature as a whole. So it's not just about inanimate objects or natural objects like, like trees, right? It applies to humans as well. So in the same way that things need certain qualities in order to function well, humans need certain qualities in order to function well. But what are the things that we need to function well? It's not ink, right? It's not a heavy head. It's not a connection between our handle and our solid head. It's not like that. It's different. We need different kinds of qualities in order to function well. So the question at this point would be, what kinds of qualities do humans need in order to function well and therefore attain their ultimate telos, which is eudaimonia, living well, right? How do we get there? Now, to understand that, we have to briefly take a look at um, some distinctions that Aristotle makes between different types of living things. For Aristotle, not all life is equal. If we were to survey all the things that are alive, we'd find that there are different types of life. And yes, they all have in common this thing called living. However, it's manifesting in these different versions, these different types. And so for Aristotle, ultimately, there's three different types of life. Um, the first type is what's called the nutritive uh, aspect, right? Or the nutritive life. And things in this category take in substance and convert it to energy. And that's it. That's the only thing that defines their life. They're taking in food, converting it to energy, and that's it. They're purely nutrition-based, right? They're nutritive. And if you're wondering what types of life form are that, well, that one's pretty easy. That's plants. That's all they do, right? But then there's a slightly higher form of life that we can call something like the sensorial version of life. And the sensory or the sensitive or the sensorial life, it contains the nutritive element, right? Each step is going to contain all the steps before it. So these life forms also take in food and convert it to energy, but they also have sense perception, right? So they take in food, convert it to energy, but also maybe they see things, or maybe they can hear things or touch things or taste things. There's something extra. And if you're wondering, well, what embodies that form of life? Animals, right? The lower animals. These things are nutritive, and yet they also have sensory perception, and they can move, right? They're, they're motile. That's the defining characteristic here. However, there's this third form of life. And this third form of life contains a nutritive component and contains a sensorial component. However, it also contains a rational component. And to have a rational component means a lot of things. It means you can think. It means you can abstract. We don't just have mere sensations. We can reflect on the sensations and the abstract. And we can calculate things, right? And we can think about the past in more detail. And we have an extended sense of the future. And I keep saying we, so I think this one's a giveaway. This is where humans lie. So humans have a nutritive component. We have sense perception, but we also have the intellect, right? That's the big part here. Um, and the, the importance of breaking this down is to explain that the function of each type of thing will be located in the category of life it is, right? So. What is the function of plants? Well, the function of life, the function of plants is clearly something nutritive, because that's what plants do. Now, what about animals? Is the function of an animal merely to be nutritive? No, the function has to involve some sensorial components since they have sense perception and can move. So the function of animals is a little bit different. Now, it works this way with humans, too. 
whatever the human function is, it's going to lie in whatever it is that makes humans human, right? So the function of plants lies in the thing that makes plants plants. The function of animals lies in the thing that makes animals animals. And the function of humans lies in whatever it is that makes humans human. And we know that thing is rationality, is intellect. So the human function will be inherently rational. Or as Aristotle puts it in the text, it will consist of activity in accord with reason. So we write that down. Okay, so the qualities we need in order to function well have to do with activity of the soul in accord with reason. And remember, um, we are trying to get to this ultimate end of eudaimonia. So you can view this as the end. And the question for us now is, well, how do we get there, right? What's the means um, of eudaimonia? I can't draw a question mark, sorry about that. So we know that if the human function is to attain eudaimonia, and that function is best served or only served through acts that are in accord with reason, we have to figure out what exactly those acts are. And for Aristotle, acts that are in accord with reason are these excellent qualities, which, here's the key word, that's the answer, it's virtue. This is why Aristotle's ethics is called virtue ethics, because he thinks virtue is the way that humans can function well. Virtue is a rational activity that allows humans to achieve their end of flourishing, of eudaimonia, of living the good life. So we need to be virtuous. Okay, now the question is, uh, but how do we do that, right? We know the role of virtue in kind of the, you know, the naturalistic economy of things, but what exactly is it, and how do we become virtuous? And these are the, the right questions to be asking. Now, the one thing you want to know about virtue is that Aristotle believes that it isn't an inherent quality in us, right? Like, we're not born virtuous, Someone isn't born living well, right? Uh, someone isn't born acting in the correct ways and possessing this quality. Nor is anyone born inherently unvirtuous, like you're not born good or bad, right? Rather, Aristotle believes that everyone is born with the capacity to become virtuous, meaning they have the potential. And they could choose to actualize that potential or they could not, right? And so there are two types of virtue, right? There's the virtues of thought, uh, but there's also the virtues of character. And these things go hand in hand well, we're going to find out that you can't have the virtues of character without the virtues of thought. And in both cases, these are things you have the capacity for, but that you don't have just by virtue of being born. No pun intended. So the thing we're ultimately going to focus on is this one, this virtue of character. We're going to talk about this intermediately, right, because like we need that in order to get here. But this is the ultimate thing we're concerned with. That's the, the ethical component proper, right? So something to understand when we're talking about character is that character is not the same thing as action. They're related. Your character is the result of actions and actions will result in character, right? But they're not exactly the same. 
And there's this difference um, between an action in isolation, right, an individual action, and character as a whole, right, overall character. And the difference between these two things is kind of like the difference between um, weather and climate. So weather is, you know, the environmental conditions, the meteorological conditions at a specific moment and place, right? It's raining. It's not raining. It's snowing. It's hot, right? But climate is the overall state of like weatherness of a given place, right? It's weather over time. You're not looking at one day or another day. You're looking at patterns. You're looking at weather over time, and that's what forms the climate, right? That's like this. Your overall character is kind of the, the sum total uh, of patterns that your individual actions result in, right? So I look at an act, I look at an act, I look at an act. I don't look at any one of those in isolation. I look at what larger patterns exist. And that larger pattern is going to tell me about your character. So the key is that when we're talking about the virtues of character and virtue in general, um, it's all about habit. It's all about repetition, right? A state of character results, he says, from the repetition of similar activities. So when we're making moral judgments and looking at the overall moral state of someone, we're not just looking about this thing that they did. We're looking about how they acted in many different situations. Like, what are their habits like? That's how we can make moral judgments. And that's already something you should notice that separates Aristotle from Kant and Mill, right? Because Mill was concerned with acts. An act is moral if it maximizes happiness, right? A Kant was concerned with acts. An act is moral if it is done in accordance with the moral law for the sake of duty, right? Aristotle's different. This guy's not talking about judging single acts as moral or immoral. He's talking about looking at someone's habits over time and judging their overall character as virtuous or not virtuous or more virtuous or less virtuous right? It's not about what you do in one day. And so this means that, for example, if you perform a good action, but you're an otherwise bad person, that doesn't mean like, oh, automatically now I'm virtuous because I did this one act. No. Similarly, if you're a good person and you do one bad thing, that also doesn't make you unvirtuous. It's not a binary, right? It's not like virtue, not virtue. It's more like a scale of being more and less virtuous. And doing one good or bad thing doesn't knock you off the horse, right? It doesn't change your overall character. If you develop new habits, then sure, that's how we can judge a new character. But um, in general, it doesn't work like, oh, I helped this old woman across the street, now I'm good. Or, uh, you know, I said something I shouldn't have said to my friend the other day, I'm a bad person. It's not like that, right? It's about overall patterns. That's the key to remember here. So. In order to be a virtuous person, you have to habitually act in the ways that the virtuous person does, right? Which means this is an all-the-time endeavor. This is a lifelong endeavor, becoming virtuous, right? This is something that could take many, many years that you have to be trained to do and that you have to practice. It's like, think about a sport, right? Let's say you play basketball. The first time you pick up a basketball, are you going to be good? No, probably not, right? You're going to have to practice, and it's the practice that makes you a good basketball player. Or if you play guitar, you pick up a guitar the first time, are you going to be good? No, it's going to be difficult, and you're going to have to try and try and try until you become better. Well, Aristotle thinks virtue kind of works like that. It's something that you have to practice, and it's something that you're not going to have automatically in the beginning. Or after you do one or two good things, it's something that slowly cultivates over time, right? And you always have the capacity, 
You always have the ability to actualize this potential, but it's on you to do that or not. The other thing to understand when we're talking about virtue is that it's all about moderation. Now, maybe you've heard this cliche before, everything in moderation. So if you've heard that, that's kind of like a bastardized version of something that ultimately goes back to Aristotle, right? This idea of the golden mean, right, or the golden ratio. So virtue winds up being an intermediate. And as you know, if something's an intermediate, that means it's between things, right? So in the case of virtue, Aristotle says that it's a mean between these two things that he calls vices. Right? And virtue lies in between these two types of vices. The one kind is a vice of excess. And this is what happens when you do too much of something or to too great of an extent, right? You're excessive. But then there's another vice, and this is called the vice of deficiency. I think I spelled that right. And this is what happens when you do something too little, right? Like not enough or to too little of an extent. You're deficient. So virtue is neither excessive nor deficient. It's in the middle of those things, right? It's the mean. You're acting appropriately, proportionally in all these things. So what would be a concrete example of that? So one of the virtues that Aristotle talks about in the text is this thing uh, called bravery, right, or courage. And bravery has to do with the amount of fear you have and the reaction you have to certain situations. Now, if someone winds up being not afraid, right, because everyone always thinks, oh, bravery means you're never afraid of anything. That's not the case. Aristotle would say, when you have a deficiency of fear, right, when you don't have enough fear, when you're someone who's like, I'm down to do anything, I don't care what the results are, I don't care what the risks are, I'm not afraid of anything. He says that's, that's foolish. That's not actually having courage. That is rashness, right? You're being rash. Conversely, when someone has an excess of fear, right, they're afraid of everything all the time, that person's not brave either, right? We call that person a coward. And so virtue always works like this. You have this quality that is desirable and beneficial in that it aids humans uh, on their journey, let's say, towards eudaimonia to live the good life and to flourish. And these qualities are always ruined by excesses and deficiencies. And it's not always right in the middle, right? Because sometimes maybe you, leave, you need a little more of something, sometimes you maybe need a little less of something, but overall it's considered the mean because it's neither excessive for the situation um, nor is it deficient for the situation. And when you're doing this, it means that you're acting correctly, right? You're doing the right thing. However, you're, you should also be doing it at the right times, right? Know when it's appropriate and know when it's not appropriate, because that's when this comes into play. But also, you have to be doing it with the right information, right? You can't accidentally be virtuous, like, oh, I didn't know this information, yet I did this thing. And after the fact, I learned that what I did was a virtuous thing, so that was good. No, it's like, you know, let's say I ran into the burning building, uh... And then I grabbed, like, my guitar case because I was like, oh, i got to save my guitar. And then I got outside and I opened the guitar case and, like, whoa, a person was in there. And so inadvertently I had saved a person from a burning building, right? Eh. Right, that's not what the virtuous person does. The virtuous person doesn't accidentally do good things, right? They have the correct information and so they can make the appropriate decision. And similarly, you need to do things for the right reason, right? If I do something and it looks like the good thing, this kind of overlaps with Kant, by the way, at least this part. 
but I do it for ulterior motive, that's not great. So it's like if I'm trying to help you do something, like I see you're struggling and then I offer you my hand and I, I give you advice and whatever. But if I'm doing that because I see, oh, someone's recording me and like, so I'm going to look good on this video and I'm going to get famous online or I'm going to be in the newspaper or on TV, right? That's not the correct reasoning. That's not the right motivation. So it's not what the virtuous person would do. That's why I was saying earlier that there's virtues of thought and they relate to whether or not you have the virtues of character. Because if you don't have the correct reasoning and the correct information and motivation, right? And you don't know how to write at the act times proportionally, you don't have that prudence, that virtue of thought, then you cannot have the virtue of character. Also, if you only have the thoughts, but don't manifest an action, that's also not virtuous. So it's like, if I see something bad happening, and I'm standing on the sideline saying, hmm, you know, that's a bad thing, I think that's improper, but I don't do anything, that doesn't make you virtuous either. So, you know, to kind of put it into these simplified, uh, almost platitudes, you would say something like, for Aristotle, um, you have to not just talk the talk, right? You have to walk the walk in addition to talking the talk. You don't just think the thoughts, let's say that, right? You don't just think the thoughts. You have to act on the thoughts. You have to walk the thought. Um, and you have to do so for the right reasons. And I think that's where we can end for virtue right now. There's so much to cover. I know it was book one and book two, but all the basic ideas should be covered at this point, right? So you want to know that for Aristotle, nature is teleological, meaning that everything is directed towards a certain end, humans included. And so humans action always points towards this ultimate end. And that ultimate telos towards which all human action points is this thing called eudaimonia, right? And there may be multiple steps, but obviously there's eudaimonia at the end. And this is living the good life and flourishing and being the best human you can be. Uh, and in order to become eudaimonious, we need certain qualities, right, in order to function well, in order to do that. And that quality of excellence for a human is being virtuous, right? Not just doing an individually good act, but becoming the virtuous person, right? Literally changing your being, which is clearly different from doing one or two things sometimes. Oh, I did this one walk and it was really nice. No. You fundamentally change the way you are, you change your habits so that you truly become virtuous so that you can live the good life and achieve eudaimonia and fulfill your telos, right? And, and that's basically Aristotle in a nutshell, books one and two of Nicomachean Ethics. Um, a lot of information to take in, but hopefully it was structured in a way that's easier to understand if you take it in little bits. If you guys have any questions, as always, feel free to email me or sign up for office hours. I'll see you around. Have a good day.